Okay, it's a few minutes after. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today on understanding senior care options for categories of planning. I'm very excited to be co-hosting this event with some experts on our panel today. I would just like to take a couple minutes to do a, a few housekeeping uh, items and then intros with our expert panel today. So if you'd be so kind, keep your line mute. You're welcome to go off screen if you'd like for this event today. The information being shared by our event experts is proprietary to each presenter. The information should be deemed as specific, uh, should not be deemed as specific guidance or direct advice to any specific situation to you. The event will be recorded today. So by joining, you are consenting to recording. If you would like to exit the event, you can do so at this time. We will also save a few minutes at the end for Q and A. I would like the group to please utilize the chat feature and post your questions in the chat, which we will monitor throughout the event today. So to get started, I'd like to introduce who is speaking today and part of this fantastic group. Today we have David Posner, who is the Vice President of Business Development for HomeCare.com and ShiftMed. David has worked in the healthcare industry for over 20 years. David currently partners with the region's hospitals, rehabs, assisted livings to help families navigate the ever-changing healthcare system and provide options for healthcare at home. When David's not working, you can find him traveling to support his daughter, Maddie, at her competitive cheer competitions. He's also an officiator for basketball at his local high school and nationally for the Big Three tournament. Just like to pause to make sure we are recording. If you need to re-record and make sure you do the intro for me again, feel free. Okay. We are recording. My apologies. So we'll start again. David Posner is the Vice President of Business Development for HomeCare.com and ShiftMed. He has worked in the healthcare industry for over 20 years. David currently partners with the region's hospitals, rehabs, and assisted livings to help families navigate the ever-changing healthcare system and provide options for healthcare at home. When David's not working, you can find him traveling with his daughter, Maddie, at her competitive cheer competitions and officiating basketball at the local high school and nationally for the big three. We also have Chantelle DiLorenzo. She is a partner with the Geller Law Group who focuses her practice on all aspects of estate planning from wills that appoint guardians for minor children to complex trusts. Chantel is focused on ensuring that clients understand their personalized documents and how they work, not only during life, but also after death. The majority of Chantel's time is spent working closely with clients to create personalized estate plans, including preparation of advanced directives, such as powers of attorney and medical directives. She counsels clients on behalf of various trusts, including irrevocable life insurance trust, qualified terminable interest property, also known as Q-tip trust, and credit shelter trust, and walks clients through the benefits of utilizing such structures. Chantel also represents clients in probate and guardianship proceedings and provides counsel for trust administration. We also have Brad Blaisdell. Brad is a financial advisor and chartered financial consultant at Edward Jones. Brad has nearly 20 years of experience in the financial planning sector. Originally from Philadelphia, Brad calls Herndon, Virginia home, where he enjoys his time with his wife and four children. And finally, myself, I am Nate Salisbury, your host uh, this afternoon. I'm a licensed nursing home administrator and a certified director of assisted living. I am the director of network development for Sunrise Senior Living based out of Northern Virginia. Additionally, I collaborate and support our Sunrise Senior Living major markets throughout the United States and Canada, where I champion the quality of life for all seniors. So with that, I'd like to welcome our expert panel today. And again, feel free to use the chat box as we move along today for any questions you might have. 
and we will do our best to address all of them on this event today. So I'd like to start with David and his presentation. Nate, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the wonderful introduction twice over. <laughs> so today, um, sure it's nice and big. All right, there you go. So yes, my name is David Posner. I am with uh, HomeCare.com and ShiftMed. Uh, HomeCare.com is one of the leading technology companies that's providing one-on-one -on -one care and nurse aids, not only in the home, but also with families at wonderful buildings like Sunrise Senior Living. Today, we're going to talk about the five steps to hiring the right nurse aide. So as you start to think about you or your loved one needing a, a CNA or, or a nurse inside the home, here are some tips that we want to be able to give you so that you can make the right choice. So let's get started. And my marketing team put this together, so I take no credit for how good this looks. <laughs> so we're going to take it back to old school, the, the five W's. Remember in elementary school, it's the who, what, when, where, and why. Thought that might be a nice, easy way to kind of remember how to make sure that you're getting the right caregiver in the home. So we're going to talk about the who, which is the caregivers. We're going to talk about the why, you know, what situations you may need a nurse aid. The what, you know, what can they provide in the home? What can they provide in assisted livings? When, as far as schedules, we're going to talk about the different hours and different days that they can work. And where, where are they going to be able to provide care? And of course, one of the bonus questions is the cost. How much does this cost? It's one of the big questions I always get asked. And at the end, I'm going to provide just a little bit of information on the company I work with, which is HomeCare.com. So hopefully you don't mind that. All right, so let's get started. Let's start with the why. Why would you need a one-on-one -on -one nurse aid? Well, a lot of situations might come up where you just want that additional support. Maybe you had a recent fall, maybe a stroke or maybe a loved one just isn't what you thought they used to be and would like some additional person giving them eyes and ears uh, so that you're able to, you know, for a loved one or a parent or something like that, you're able to get some eyes and ears on what's going on, right? So another situation where you might just return from the hospital. A lot of our family members have fallen multiple times. We end up in the hospital because of a fall or a stroke. We end up in a rehab and now they're finally coming home. And they're realizing that their home isn't as easy to access as it normally was. Maybe they've got a boot on, maybe they're on crutches, and they just need that little extra support to do the little things like laundry, like meal prep, like medication, or even take them to the drugstore and pick up some medication or go to get some groceries for them. Or maybe their loved one used to, maybe it was a, a wife who used to always do everything and now she's got her, she can't help, and now we need someone to help with, with the dad. And so having that extra person in the home, just to provide what we call companionship or personal type of care services, are some of the things we're gonna be talking about. Reminiscence, memory care. So reminiscence is basically memory care. It's, it's the sunrise term, I wanna throw that in there today. Uh, so if your loved one is going into a memory care community, maybe you have dementia or Parkinson's or something along those, another cognitive issue, that might be another need for having that one-on-one -on -one support in the home. We're going to talk about a uh, hold list. So at the wonderful Sunrise building, some of them are full and where you might need some additional one-on-one -on -one support in the home until a wonderful bed opens up. And finally, one of the things that HomeCare.com does above anybody else is actually last minute needs. So like I mentioned earlier, if you found out your, your, your mom or dad is about to be discharged it's Thursday at four o'clock and they might be discharged tomorrow, Friday at 8 a.m. Having someone that can be at the home or meet them at the hospital is gonna be critical. One of the things that HomeCare.com does really, really well is be able to provide that last minute care so that your loved one is safe when they return home from hospital, rehab or something along those lines. So those are some of the whys that we'd like to talk about. Next, we're gonna talk about the who. The who, these caregivers are amazing. And the most important thing when we talk about caregivers is also making sure you're working with a good, solid, quality company. So how do we do that? Well, we look at our referrals. We look at the people on this panel and we ask them who they would recommend. Who would Chantel, for an attorney, who would she recommend for home care? We'd ask Brad, a money manager, who they would think of for having a, a trustworthy company. And we would also, when we talk to these home care companies, what are their reviews? What are their ratings? 
it doesn't matter how long a company's been around because there's companies that have been around for 50 years. And it doesn't matter about cost because we all know that sometimes you get what you pay for. So when we look into home care companies, we really want to make sure it's a solid company that's been vetted, rated, and reviewed. Now, when we talk about the caregivers, there's, depth, there's several different types of licensing that you might see. I don't want to get into details now, but if you do want me to go into detail, go ahead and leave a question in the chat box, and I'm happy to, to kind of break down each of them. But basically, the most important thing is that any caregiver that comes to your loved one, you want to make sure that they are licensed. And some of the licenses that you might see is a CNA, which is a certified nursing aide, an HHA, a home health aide, a PCA, personal care aide, or even a GNA, a geriatric nurse aide. These are some of the licenses. And the differences between them is basically just the training and how long. It could be anywhere from six weeks to eight months as far as the different types of training and ongoing training. But most importantly, you want to make sure that your caregiver coming into that home is not only licensed, but that the license is up to date and valid. The next thing you may want to consider is interviewing caregivers. So one of the biggest tips I always give families when they're interviewing caregivers is talk about real situations. So if your mom is, uh, has dementia and she's a wandering risk, ask the caregiver or even the home care company, how would you handle my mom when she wants to bolt and get out of the house? How would you, what if my mom is aggressive or racist, which actually unfortunately does happen? How would you handle that? How are you gonna handle care, uh, uh, a person who doesn't want you in the home? Have you had that situation before? How, how would you handle that? And the nice thing about the caregivers is most of them should have been through situations like that. One of the things that we make sure we do before sending any caregiver into the home is making sure that it's a perfect match. So if a family member has dementia, it's with a caregiver that has five or more years of dementia or five or more years of experience with Parkinson's, stroke, fall prevention. So when you ask caregivers during the interview, give them real scenarios of what's going on and see how they would react to certain, to certain situations. Lastly, you want to make sure that we do, you do a background check. And most of the home care companies that you work with will already do this for you. They'll do a full background check. And in the state of Virginia, there's actually a police background check. Some states require federal background checks and state background checks. So it's really important to make sure you have all of those checks in place, that they're all up to date and valid. And lastly, testimonials and referrals. You want to be able to ask the caregiver or the home care company you're working with, who has this caregiver worked with before? May I reach out to a former family and be able to get their reviews? One of the nice things about homecare.com is that we keep all of the testimonials handy. And each of our caregivers has several reviews that we'll be able to pass on to any loved ones to let them know what this caregiver has done and any families that want to reach out. So next we're going to talk about the what. What can they provide? Well, you may have heard of this medical, non-medical. So let's start with that. So there's three levels of care that caregivers can actually provide. Companionship, personal care, and advanced personal care. One of the things that you don't see on here is medical. So what the caregivers here are being able to provide is what's considered non-medical or personal care or companion care services. So at the, at the lowest level, the companion care is basically a friend in the home. They can help around the house. So if your loved one is, is sitting on crutches and just needs a little bit of help around the house, with housekeeping, meal preps, errands, conversations, maybe a trip to the grocery store, that's companionship level care. The next level up or higher is called personal care. These might also be referred to as ADLs or activities of daily living. You have some type of long-term care insurance or veterans benefits, which I'm sure Chantel might talk about briefly. Those long-term care insurance plans will ask for ADLs, but two of the six will be required. So those personal care things that the caregiver can provide are things such as grooming, bathing, dressing, feeding, toileting, and medication reminders. Then the third level, the most advanced level, is caregivers that have a level of experience with fall prevention, dementia, Parkinson's, and stroke. Because these, th these personal care needs, the dementia, the Parkinson's, and the strokes, is a really higher level of need because of what the disease happens to, to the loved one or the family member. So these are all the different levels of care that the caregiver that I mentioned earlier can provide. So finding out what your needs are and being able to match them up is going to be critical. Again, 
What you don't see on here is medical. So when we talk about therapy, that's a completely different level of care. We can also partner, we partner with companies that do provide that. But again, when we're talking about home care services, it's basically companion, personal, and damage. The next thing I want to talk about is when. One of the biggest questions I get from families is, I need a caregiver, but I'm not really sure when or how long, but when I need them, I need them. But I only need them here and there and sometimes on the third Tuesday of the month. Well, unfortunately, caregivers are like you and I. They want a full schedule. And so the way to start thinking about schedules is two different tips. Number one is what I've got here. So think about this, the more hours, the less costs. And what do I mean by that? So the four hours, the minimum amount of hours that we can cover, that most home care companies can buy, all the way up to 12, 24, or even living. The more hours you need, this is per day, excuse me, 12, 24 livings, the less cost. The reason, because it's easier for us to find a caregiver that wants to work 12 and 24 hour care and it is for a caregiver that wants to just work four hours a day. When you start to think about your day and when those hours might come in, start to walk through your day. This is something that I commonly do with all of the families that I work with. And I say, whenever they say, I don't know what I need. So let's just talk about your day. What time do you wake up in the morning? When do you usually take a shower? In the morning or in the afternoon? You'll probably need help getting in, getting out and getting dressed. What time do you usually have your first meal? Is it you wake up early and have it at 6 a.m., or do you like to sleep in and have it at 10 a.m.? That may determine what time the caregiver arrives. Also, do you go to bed early at 6 p.m., or are you a late person that stays up till 12 o'clock midnight? All of these things will determine what is the best schedule for you and the caregiver, because the most important thing is finding a caregiver that wants to work within the schedule based off of their needs. Also, medication. What time do you have to take the medication and making sure that someone is there to make sure you have each and every day. Lastly, when we talk about when is livings. So livings were actually changed a couple of years ago by a federal law that actually requires the caregiver to get 16, that the hours is actually charged at 16 hours a day, meaning eight hours of the caregiver's time is considered sleeping. Five of it must be uninterrupted. So the caregiver must have a room that has a door and a bed. So if you're starting to think about having a live-in, make sure they have a door, make sure they have a bed, and make sure that you allow them to sleep up to five hours without any interruption. You're not charged for that, but again, that's gonna be part of the requirement. If you need someone to be there 24 seven, as you get up and down, up and down throughout the night, then we're looking at much more of a 12 hour, a 24 hour shift, and that can be split up usually 12 and 12. Finally, the where. Where can you get a home? Where can you get a caregiver? Well, anywhere that you call home, that's where a caregiver can be there to help. So, two main places, right? So, number one is in the home. And this is the biggest benefit of having a caregiver in the home is it's your home. And the caregiver can do anything that you want them to do. That's from bathing to meals to groceries to taking out the garbage. Whatever you need in your home, the caregiver is there to be able to provide the care. That's one of the most common places where you see our nurse aides being able to provide care is actually in the home. However, we do provide care inside assisted livings and independent livings. What are some of the reasons you might have a one-on-one -on -one nurse aide in a phenomenal place like Sunrise Senior Living? Well, if they have a home list, some of the Sunrise buildings are full and you can't get in. So you put a deposit and you have to wait. Well, what Sunrise does is they actually partner with homecare.com and we provide the one-on-one -on -one care until a room opens up. And many times we actually can bring the, the loved one to the community for bingo and other visitation. So until a room opens up and you're on that hold list, we're able to provide that one-on-one -on -one care in the home. The second is for new families. If a new loved one is just moving into a sunrise or any independent or assisted living, they might want a little, they might want a companion. Be able to show them around the building. Since we have a great relationship with Sunrise as well as many of the other assisted livings, we know the buildings inside and out, but we can introduce your loved one to the staff. We can help make sure that they're getting out to events, community events, and we can make sure that they're getting out and going to the places where they're not stuck in their room. So a lot of times we see uh, a need inside assisted livings inside uh, during the first few days. And then lastly, is just that one-on-one -on -one care in the building. 
because of the ratios associated with assisted living to independent livings, your loved one might need that one-on-one -on -one care inside the bed. Maybe they're returning from the hospital. Maybe they just had an injury. Maybe they're a risk to themselves or someone else. And they might just need a one-on-one -on -one person to keep an eye on them and make sure that they're safe. This is another reason that we're able to provide that one-on-one -on -one care inside the building. So we can provide, the caregivers can provide care anywhere that you call home. Bonus question, how much, how much is all of this gonna cost you? Well, price is usually determined by three main factors, location, needs, and schedule. So when we think about location, we wanna think about cities versus rural, right? So it's a lot easier in the city because we have a lot more caregivers than we do maybe in rural Iowa, you know, where it might be a little bit tougher for us to be able to find a caregiver. So depending on your location, we'll also start to determine the price of care. Again, the closer you live to a major metropolitan city, easier it is to find caregivers. The second is the needs, and this is common, right? So if we're just having companionship, we're just making sure your loved one is safe, that's gonna be on the lower end than someone that's providing dementia, Parkinson's, and hospice care. Lastly is schedule, and I talked about this earlier, but again, this is the flip, right? So when we talk about the least cost, that's something that is eight, 10, 12 hours, versus something that's simply just four hours where it might cost a little bit more. The average cost in your area, you can actually go on to genworth.com and look up the average cost of care in your area, but in the DC metro area, it's about 28 to 38, 28 to 30 dollars an hour. One of the biggest common questions I said, how much does all this cost? Again, in the DC metro area right now, it's about 28 to 30. However, for families on this call today, um, all you have to do is mention this call when you call homecare.com and we do have discounted rates for families, especially those that are working with Sunrise, those that are working with the Geller Group, and those who are working with Edward Jones. Happy to provide a discount. Just ask and mention this, this webinar. Lastly, when we talk about costs, we got to talk about the addition. So 90% of families pay out of pocket, but for those 10% that have long-term care insurance, and we're talking about Gen Worth or John Hyatt um, or veterans benefits, those two, two services do help pay for care. Unfortunately, right now, the health insurance, your Aetna's, the Blue Cross, they don't pay for home care services. We pay for therapy, we don't pay for private duty one-on-one -on -one care. But if you do need any support, we do have some contacts with the veterans that we can help connect you if you're a veteran and you're looking for information on that. Again, same with long-term care insurance, but I know uh, both Brad and Chantel will mention further details on that. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna take two minutes. I'm gonna talk about my fantastic company, homecare.com. I have been working for this company for a long time. I love it. It's one of the best companies out there, but let me tell you why. Three main differences between us and our competition. Number one is our volume of nurses. In just the DC metro area, we have over 3,000 nurses. We have over 10,000 nationwide. We're in, we're in 12 states uh, nationwide. We use a special technology to make sure that the right care, caregiver gets to your home. And most importantly, we never miss a detail. Being a technology-based company, we're able to send text alerts to make sure that the caregiver arrives on time, or at least you're able to get updates. We're able to send uh, everything through electronics to make sure you're, you're getting everything that you need, um, uh, if it's ADLs for long-term care insurance or something like that. And finally, just bios and, and information on the caregiver. So everything through us is technology, which makes things better faster and more comfortable. But what I'd like to do is just take two minutes and, clear, and give you a quick case study of a family that we're working with. And so we have a Barton family that we've worked with. And so this is a family where they're elderly, 86, 90 years old, uh, husband and wife, where the husband has been taking care of the wife as she starts to uh, have get into higher stages of dementia. And unfortunately, the husband I uh, just uh, fell, broke his hip, and is in the hospital. So now the question is, what are we gonna do with the wife who really can't do too much at home? So the family, the son actually called us up and said, hey, can you help us out? And so we were able to go in there, do an assessment, and meet with uh, the wife, Ellie, and be able to just talk to her and let her know what we're gonna be able to provide. We're in there for about 12 hours a day, just during the daytime, because she sleeps during the night. And when the husband comes back the first couple of days, we might even extend it just to make sure that the, that the couple is gonna be able to take care. 
So one of the things that we're doing is we are working not only with the hospital that's going to discharge the husband, we're working with the therapy teams that are with the wife and daughter. Um, as they consider moving into assisted living, obviously we'll be partnering up with Sunrise. Um, but one of the things that we're doing is most importantly is we're communicating with the son. So all the documentation was sent to him by email. He knows which caregivers are there at which times so that when he does call in to check on his, on his mom, he knows exactly which caregiver is most likely to pick up the phone. The other thing that we provided is complete bio of the caregiver. So that not only does the son know exactly who's there, but he's able to relay that on to his mom. So when the mom opens the door each morning, he's able to text her and say, hey, by the way, Janice should be there about 8 a.m. Uh, please let her in. And this family has been going on for about two weeks right now. Um, many of our families last anywhere from, I don't know, uh, 90 days. So we've got families up to three years. So nothing with us has to be long term. If you need us for a short term, we can help with that too. So it's a little bit of what we do. But now my question is for you, the audience out there. And we're not taking questions now, so obviously leave your, your answers in the chat in the box below. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to start thinking about why you joined this call today. Start thinking about that loved one that maybe couldn't be on this call today and where they could benefit from one-on-one -on -one care. And if it is one-on-one -on -one care that homecare.com could provide, I would love to be able to help them out. Again, be able to answer that. Uh, if you want to leave your information in the chat box, I'm happy to talk to them or you can contact me directly. Again, no questions right now, but uh, you can always contact me here. So my phone number is 703-667-0201. I'll repeat that again. So 703-667-0201. You can call me or text me at any time. My email address is below as well. Thank again, you, Dave. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave it in the text below. Otherwise, I really appreciate everyone's time uh, today. And next up, I'm gonna introduce one of my great friends, Chantel, with the Geller Law Group. She is the best when it comes to estate planning. Without any further ado, Chantel, Thanks. it's all yours. All right, let me get my screen shared for you guys. Give me one second. Are we good? Thumbs up. Brad's nodding. I'll take Brad's word on it. All right. Hi, guys. My name is Chantel DiLorenzo. I am a partner at the Geller Law Group. Um, I chair our trust and estate practice. I also work with probate, do trust administration, all the other various things that, um, that had been mentioned in my bio. So what I'm here to talk to you guys about is how to plan for basically the unexpected and how do we put documents in place that help you or uh, family members you know, uh, avoid a crisis. So when we look at estate planning, you know, I start off a call with a client and I say, hey, we're gonna talk, you know, usually in estate planning you think, well, it's a will, right? We're talking about what happens when it pass, but we actually look at estate planning comprehensively at my firm. So I want to talk to clients about how to plan for uh, avoiding that crisis situation if they're alive, um, but also at death. So for a living document, you know, how do we help make sure you're taken care of during your lifetime. That's a power of attorney and a medical directive. Um, with a death planning, you know, we're back to kind of that will conversation of, of that traditional, you know, you, you see the movies, they're having this formal reading of a will. So we're talking about a will, potentially a trust, depending on goals, um, and also something called a transfer on death feed a lot of times. So, and I guess before I go further, I should let you guys know, most of my practice is, you know, DMV based. So I'm not, like, I'm licensed in New York as well, um, but you know it, it is not legal advice outside of this area. And so, if you want to talk to somebody like that, transfer on death feed, that's jurisdiction specific, so it's state specific. You don't have to talk to an attorney licensed in your state if you guys are outside of the area. So, just something to keep in mind. Um, these laws do vary greatly from state to state. So, starting with your life documents, um, a power of attorney. This is probably one of the more commonly used documents or, or most people tend to have one or at least be familiar with it. Um, power of attorney appoints an agent, sometimes called an attorney in fact, um, to make legal and financial decisions for you only while you are alive. So it is a lot of times used in perhaps a gray area of life. You know, there is um, an onset of dementia or Alzheimer's or there has been an accident and somebody needs assistance. Um, 
the attorney in fact does not need to be an attorney. I get asked that a lot. Most people are looking to family members, right? You know, my power of attorney has my spouse as my first agent. Just because he's my spouse doesn't mean he gets access to all of my individually owned assets. So I need to give him that ability to access those accounts if God forbid something happens to me. Um, there is a unique type of power of attorney called a springing power of attorney that is only effective when a certain trigger happens. So it is usually a, a physician's note saying, hey, Chantal is incapacitated. She now needs assistance um, making financial or legal decisions. So the difference here, a, a standard power of attorney, general durable power of attorney, my husband as my agent goes to that car agency, he buys a car, puts both of our names on the title. I don't have to be there, right? I'm not, I'm not negotiating and haggling on this price. He's doing that, but I'm gonna be a co-owner because he's my power of attorney. It's benefiting me, it's, it's useful to me. Um, if it's a springing power of attorney, similar concept, similar scenario, but before he can do that, before he puts my name on anything, he has to have a doctor's note that says, Chantel now needs assistance for this. So power of attorney during lifetime only, legal financial decisions. Medical directive, again, only during life, right? We're talking about somebody who's going to make healthcare decisions for you. Um, these come by all sorts of different names. It varies based on, again, jurisdiction. It varies based on the firm that you're working with. My law firm calls them advanced medical directives. They also can be called healthcare proxies, living wills, healthcare power of attorneys. Um, these, the difference between health, uh, power of attorney and a medical directive is this limited to healthcare decisions and it's only going to be effective when you're incapacitated. If you can make your own medical decisions, this is not taking away that right from you. So no need to get nervous about it. It is truly planning for that crisis situation. Your medical agent is going to work with your healthcare team. Um, this could include a HIPAA waiver, right? So they can access medical documents. It should include a HIPAA waiver, quite honestly. Um, but then you're also going to give them instructions about what you feel comfortable with for your end of life care. This can include DNR or the authorization to sign a DNR order, uh, life support and terminal conditions, organ donation. You know, it's, it's pretty comprehensive and it can be very, very narrowly tailored if that's what you want. Um, the medical directives are something we recommend looking at, you know, every, I would say probably three to five years life changes, what you think is important for end of life care now will be potentially different, you know, five years down the road. So you wanna make sure that you're looking at it, keeping it up to date and making sure that your agent is ready to take this on because um, it, it's a big hurdle. All right, so those are our, our living documents. Now to shift over to death, we have our will versus trust. Another thing I get asked a lot about, what, what do I need a will, do I need a trust? Not quite sure, I've heard them both. Um, few differences, right? These are just very briefly. There's, there's actually a lot more differences, but a will is going to name an executor. So you hear that term a lot. That's, that is named in a will. Wills go to probate, potentially another term you hear a lot of. Probate is a court process that if you own an asset in your name alone, no joint owner, no beneficiary, it's going to trigger that court process. So during that process is when a will is brought forward to say, aha, this is who the beneficiary is and this is who the executor is. So the will goes to probate. Probate is court, it is public record. Just a heads up. Uh, to contrast, trust, names a trustee. Similar role to an executor, they're making sure your wishes are honored, um, but there is no probate. So they're not going to court. They're not working with that uh, judge or the commissioner, right? They're handling this on their own or with the assistance of a law firm, but they're not in court, hopefully. Um, and then for the trust to work, it has to be properly funded. So we're thinking through that beneficiary and joint ownership analysis, looking to a trust. Um, and that's where, you know, oftentimes I'm gonna talk to financial advisors to say, hey, how are accounts actually titled? Let's help them understand this process. The trust is put in place. We need to have assets flow into and fund the trust. Um, and then the benefit of that trust is it's private. A uh, decent amount of clients are not potentially treating all kids fairly, right? Or maybe have a favorite grandchild. Trust is a really good way to make sure that, that you can make that happen without too much family drama. Um, so there's some benefits of the trust. Both documents, though, they are going to identify a beneficiary to inherit your assets. 
right? That's the end result. You are saying, I want my sister, my mom, and my best friend to get everything. Either one is going to accomplish that. It's just the route. It's the path that's going to take before that happens. All right, so wills. Wills go to probate. Probate assets are things owned in your name alone. They don't typically apply to joint, uh, jointly owned assets um, and assets with beneficiary designations. So kind of like the big bucket items, right? Like retirement, life insurance. A lot of times those are set up with beneficiaries, hopefully. Um, your jointly owned accounts, if you're married, usually your spouse is already a co-owner. So it's important to understand how assets actually work with estate planning. Um, my comment on appointing executor considering location is it's court, right? There's going to be interactions. They might have to go there in person. Um, and a lot of jurisdictions, especially locally, require your executor to be a resident of that state. So if you had a will drawn up in Ohio, and Ohio doesn't, I don't know, but if Ohio doesn't have the same law, it is worth reconsidering, right? Now you're in Virginia, Virginia does have this law. Maybe one of your kids is in Ohio and one is in Virginia. Make the Virginia one your executor. It might help out. Trust. Two big types of trust, revocable and irrevocable. Revocable, primary purpose is it avoids probate. It can be changed during your lifetime. It's a very flexible planning tool. Irrevocable and not be changed, it is usually used for asset protection. Um, they're more complex, there's more tax considerations and anything involving taxes, you wanna pull in your CPA, you wanna pull in your financial advisor. So those trusts we're, we're working as a team to collaborate on. Um, the benefit of trusts, again, private, you can put restrictions on when your beneficiaries inherit. So, uh, you know, have a young child or a young grandchild you want to receive money you're not going to give it to a four-year-old right they're going to go out and buy stickers and legos so you're going to say hey this money is available for you when you're older um you have to fund that trust for it to work you're going to work with your financial advisor you're going to you know talk to your attorney about what that process looks like but the trust instrument is a really great way to plan and to put strings attached to that gifting process uh and then finally very briefly, transfer on death deed. This is very state specific, um, but it's a really unique and, and advantageous planning tool. It allows you to keep title of your house in your own name. And I know for so many people, that's really important. Um, so you remain the homeowner, but it works like a beneficiary designation. So it, it's my property now, but I say, oh, I want my sister to have it. Something happens to me. Transfer on death deed identifies her as the beneficiary. Um, for that to be effective, it would have to be recorded before I pass. And typically the, the deed work is the only thing that gets recorded in an estate planning process. So, you know, when you're working with my firm, we're, we're saying, okay, keep your originals in a safe place. We'll handle filing the deed for you. Um, but it's not like everything has to go and be recorded because again, this is all gonna be private for you. Uh, so I think, I think that's it. I think I'm okay on time. Um, Again, my name is Chantal T. Lorenzo. I would be so happy to talk to anybody if they have questions. Um, we offer free consultations. If you mention this, we'll do an additional discount from, from the fees. But um, that is my contact information that hopefully you guys can still see. And it was really nice to present. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Chantal. I know Brad is queuing up for his deck. Brad Blaisdell with Edward Jones. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Chantel and David. Um, so I will try to be uh, brief here. Uh, I know we're getting late in the hour and you guys have done an amazing job uh, with your attention. So I'll, I'll try to go as, uh, as quickly as possible. A couple of things I want to touch on that both David and Chantel um, and Nathan, for that matter, all spoke on is having a team. Um, I think it's incredibly important that you have a team when you're working, when you're doing your uh, retirement planning, your estate planning, your long-term care planning, your uh, home health care planning, so that we all will work together to provide what's best and, and most advantageous for your individual specific situation. Um, so as we talk, I'm going to talk about health care and retirement and what that really means and ways to address it. So when we start talking about healthcare and retirement, there are your traditional medical expenses, and then there's some of those long-term care medical uh, expenses. So your traditional, that's going to be your doctors, your emergency rooms, 
her ambulances, any prescriptions, uh, dental care, things like that. While your long-term care, that's going to be some of the stuff that was mentioned earlier regarding assisted living, adult daycare, home health care, nursing homes. And so they're going to break down into two totally different categories. Both of those categories will work with you all. Um, and any good financial planner should be working with you as they build your retirement plan. So um, our process is, is kind of taking a look at where you're at, where you want to go, um, how can we help you get there? And then periodically um, reviewing it to make sure you're still on track to find out if anything has changed, if any of those costs have changed, or if any of those events have happened that require you to need some of your long-term care, your uh, home health care, things like that. You heard Chantel mention transfer on death. Um, that's a huge one that we oftentimes recommend our clients have. Uh, specifically for your um, non-retirement accounts, because most everybody has a beneficiary designated with your retirement accounts, but it's your non-retirement accounts, it's your um, single bank accounts, it's your uh, single investment accounts, that oftentimes you don't have a transfer on death, and that's where things can get a little messy, as Chantal had previously mentioned. So I'm a huge proponent of that. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Chantel. So your insurance options kind of come down into if you um, are still working, you have them through work, you have a lot of your medical insurance is going to be covered through work if you work for an employer that provides it. Um, if you're 65 or older, you have Medicare, uh, you should have signed up for it. We're kind of going to go through a little bit of that and what signing up for it looks like. Um, if you're under 65 and not working and not covered by a family member or spouse, uh, then you have to look into getting insurance on your own. We're not really going to dive too much into that today. We're going to talk specifically about Medicare options and what's available to you at 65. So have, um, part A and part B are what everybody signs up for at 65. Um, they're going to cover things like going to the doctors, they're going to cover um, your your emergency room visits, your ambulance visits, things like that. That's what's going to be covered under Part A and Part B. It's the hospital and doctor, as it says. Part D is something you have to sign up for in addition. That's going to be your prescription drugs. And then your Medigap, there's eight different types of Medigap insurance. That's added on additional stuff for covering deductibles and so on and so forth. Part C is your Medicare Advantage. That'll cover Part A and B. That's going to be provided through a um, Medicare approved vendor. Uh, and that's going to cover a lot of the different things that would be covered through um, your Medigap and your Part D. It will also include your A and B in there. Okay. Um, Important dates to think about as you talk about Medicare insurance, eight months um, you have to enroll, three months pr prior to uh, turning 65, and then the five months after. If you miss that, you have January through March of every calendar year to, re to sign up. That's the special enrollment period. We're going to run through a quick estimate on out-of-pocket expenses. So part A is free. Everybody gets it when you turn 65. Part B, average about $1,800. Um, part D is your prescription, about $500. And the Medigap G, we find to be the most comprehensive Medigap insurance. Puts you at about $4,500. Between that and between $6,500 per person or $10,000 to $12,000 per couple. That's for Medicare insurance. Now, Medicare will cover a short, limited period of time in a facility if you need long-term care, um, long-term health care in a facility. So long as you are showing progress, they will cover up to, I believe it's 90 days, at which point you are no longer covered by Medicare and you are on your own dime. The just average, so I'll come back to that in a minute. All right, so long-term care insurance was mentioned earlier. 
So I think somebody said Genworth, John Hancock, those are traditional long-term care insurance policies out there. Most of the insurance companies have gotten out of the traditional long-term care insurance market, and now they're hybriding life insurance and long-term care. Um, it will cover, uh, you need to uh, have a doctor say you need assistance with two of your six activities of daily living that were mentioned earlier by David for it to trigger. Um, then when it triggers, you're handing off some of that cost or some of that expense to the insurance company because you've been paying for the long-term care insurance, either through a traditional policy or the rider. Covers the nursing home care, the assisted living, the home health care, and adult daycare. Just to give you, so we have at the bottom, right, the costs vary. Now, one of the costs that we can tell you that we briefly looked up here, the average cost of care in Virginia, most of us sitting on this call are in Virginia, or at least your presenters are. So the average cost there, you can see at the bottom, home health aid, about $4,300. This is on average. So talk to David about what that specifically means. Um, assisted living facility, about $4,800. Or if you need full nursing home, somewhere between seventy six dollars and 8800 Again, talk to Nathan, I'll speak in a minute about where Sunrise and Home Health Care come in there. Those are just average costs. And so if you're looking at the, the numbers and what the percentages are and the odds of you hitting it, the statistics out there say that right now, 30% of Americans over 65 are going to need some sort of long-term health care. And 30% of that 30% are going to need it for more than two years. So when you start averaging these monthly costs and what that means, um, that could be a lot of money out of your pocket on a monthly basis. So how do you prepare? You either save for it on, on your own or you insure against it. We talked about some of the insurance, traditional policies and the life with the long-term care riders or you save for it through your investments, right? No matter which route you choose to go through, um, I'm going to strongly encourage you to sit down with your financial advisor, your financial planner, so that you can tie in all parties to this team, your estate planning attorney, your assisted living person, because we're all going to want to work together as well as getting your accountant in there if there's estate planning things that we need to take care of. Obviously, we're going to talk about directives. You heard Chantel talk about having living wills, uh, having the advanced directives, the health care power of attorney, all that stuff. It, we believe as the financial planners that are managing these teams oftentimes are super important that you get taken care of. And we're going to tell you to ideally get them taken care of before you need them and update them every three to five years, right? Because if you wait till you need it, it's probably too late. And if you haven't updated it since 2005, um, it's probably time to update it because many tax laws have changed in that time frame, and how thing is titled and deeded needs to change with that. Uh, one of the things that Chantel mentioned was the wills and trusts, and I think you mentioned it, Chantel, um, but I'm going to echo it. Making sure your trusts are funded is the biggest issue we find when our clients um, are, are, have passed on and we're dealing with the next generation. Um, we find that oftentimes some of their trusts that they thought were funded, they were not funded, they did not title or deed the stuff appropriately. So, uh, quick little plug for me. If you don't have a financial advisor, I'd love to be yours and help you. Um, if you have one, please, the questions that you wrote down during this this presentation, go talk to them. Talk to them about whether a will or a trust is appropriate for you. Talk to them about their relationship with somebody like David and home health care and how they'll help you. Talk to them about what their relationship is with something like buddy like Nathan and, and Sunrise. Um, and a quick testimony on, and I'm not being paid for this, but I will say that it is my relationship with Nathan um, and Chantel and David that have helped some of my clients most recently in the last six months get placed in assisted living and have someone come into their home prior to them getting into assisted living. Um, that we were able to do this, not just 
here in Northern Virginia, but also up in Pennsylvania for them. And, and, and without these relationships, we wouldn't have been able to fast track that. We wouldn't have been able to update their wills and trusts without Chantel and the Geller group. So I'm going to strongly recommend you talk to whoever's leading your team and helping your team so that we can make sure that you're taken care of. Uh, Nate, I think I hopefully got us close to caught up. Um, I'm going to turn it back to you. I'll stop sharing my screen. You can take it over. All right. Coming in the home stretch here. I know we're up on time, so I will make it quick. But I do want to share about Sunrise and who we are, uh, providing senior living care since 1981. Our founders, Paul and Terry Clausen, started right here in Northern Virginia. Oakton, Virginia was our first community. There's a picture on the screen there. We, Paul and Terry started with a very small home and they started welcoming residents in 81 and taking care of each resident within that home. Paul and Terry provided all the services, activities, dining, medical, clinical needs. Uh, they did it all. They were the originators of Sunrise. And shortly after uh, serving many residents in this home in Oakton, Virginia, the Clausen started our first, they built our first Victorian mansion style community in Northern Virginia just outside of Washington, D.C. in 1987. Uh, today, we have more than 300 communities throughout the U.S. and in Canada and the United Kingdom. And we provide uh, various levels of care uh, from independent living where you can buy a condo or um, a piece of property and live on in our communities to skilled nursing, assisted living, memory care, short-term stays and respite stays. Our mission hasn't changed uh, since our first executive director asking Paul and Terry when they opened that, that second building, uh, Paul and Terry, where, where's the handbook? Um, these were the things that the Clausens came up with for our principles of service and how we champion the quality of life for seniors. And you can see it's preserving residents' dignity, nurturing the spirit. We celebrate uh, individuals in our communities, of course, freedom of choice, and we love encouraging independence as much as possible in our communities and having families and friends involved at our communities with our residents. Our core values, and these are things that really are shared across the board and expectations of professionals that we partner with at Sunrise and our team members that provide the care is that we want passionate, compassionate service team members uh, taking care of our seniors. We want them to have a joy in the service they provide, to be good stewards, and of course, having respect and a very high level of trust, which typically happens in a very short amount of time when families are looking to make a decision to move into Sunrise. Just a very brief snapshot. We are reporting out of Northern Virginia market um, so just a brief snapshot, we have 16 communities in the Northern Virginia footprint, and we have other major markets across the United States. So I encourage you to check out um, our locations on sunriseseniorliving.com if you're interested in learning if there's something close to where you are located. We, we are continuing to open new communities throughout the United States, specifically here in Northern Virginia, in Old Town, Alexandria. It's really blends right into historic Old Town with our design and residential setting. We have others opening in Fairfax later this year and then throughout the rest of the United States. So what, what makes Sunrise different? And I can say we are different because of how we handle our model of care in our communities and that the residential setting, which goes back to Paul and Terry on that first home they built, every room they designed, it, they designed it as a residential setting. And when they moved a new person in, a new person always wanted Paul and Terry's uh, suite or bedroom that they had because it was furnished like a residential setting. 
we still continue to this day to utilize that model of, of care and, and how the aesthetics of our communities um, throughout Sunrise. We also have a very core focused evidence-based uh, wellness programs in our communities. They handle everything from nutrition, dining, wound care, um, a, a variety of clinical aspects that are evidence-based on the care that is being provided to residents who live at Sunrise. And we really, during these challenging times with COVID, have, have really prided ourselves on our holistic approach with Live With Purpose. Even when we went through the challenges of locking, locking down buildings and visitors being limited, um, still being able to support our residents with mind, body, and spirit through our Live With Purpose programming. We also have uh, electronic records that talk to doctors, hospitals, skilled nursings, home health groups. So we have a level of continuity of care and communication that happens um, throughout, you know, service that's being provided for our residents. Of course, we do lots and lots of intense onboarding and training for our team members who join Sunrise with a continued track to grow within our organization. We do real-time surveys, real-time feedback. We are previous winners of the JD Power Associate Award for the number one senior living company in the United States. I talked briefly about our evidence-based wellness programs. This is a specific breakdown for each one. I won't read them all to you, but you can see uh, specifically how we handle. And I think one to highlight is our behavioral expressions, which really uh, focuses on the validation method that we are, Sunrise is a trained validation method uh, group. And that really focuses on Alzheimer's dementia diagnosis of residents. I shared a little bit about our Care Connect, and this is our electronic platform on how we really track activities, how progress is going with our residents, medication management. We have a one, uh, one location where all of that data is captured and it's easily shared, um, of course, within compliance with families, with our other uh, attending clinical providers that service the community that that resident may be working with it really streamlines how we take care of continuity of care across the board. If it's different types of providers providing that care, they have one place to go with real-time updates and real-time access to care for that resident and document that information. Talked about our Live With Purpose programming. We developed our own app, our Smile app, and that really keeps families engaged with what's going on at the community. So when they call and talk to their loved one and say, I haven't done anything in a week around this place, um, families can actually see what's going on day to day with our Smile app and how they can be connected and see what the residents are participating in, the upcoming calendars, share photos, um, do live streaming video chats with each other. So we have the capabilities through technology of which if there's a resident that's not capable to run that technology, we're there to support it through these Live With Purpose programs. I, I talked briefly on our in-depth team member training. We, we really are best in class with our memory care validation that we do at Sunrise for our, our David mentioned the reminiscence um, neighborhood that we have that we service uh, our, our residents with memory impairment. Uh, we, we do extra uh, annual training, onboarding with uh, regard to Alzheimer's or dementia and managing behavioral expressions. We have secured neighborhoods for our memory care residents. We also have tenured job coaches that are teaching uh, compassionate people who want to join Sunrise the right way to provide care to our seniors. So COVID, we, we didn't really talk too much about that on this call, but we're, we're really happy to say that we, we have come out of the shell. We're, we're making a tremendous progress with vaccines and having team members and residents vaccinated. We, we were on the forefront uh, again, Sunrise, with our contact tracing, our evidence-based infection control, which we've had in place for many, many, many years. We didn't 
create an infection control program to battle COVID. We already had it in place. And that really was a testament to our success of managing COVID in our communities through, throughout the United States. So I, I talked a little bit about respite stays. I think this is a good highlight at Sunrise Senior Living in, in various markets across the country. Um, the respite and road home programs, these are really designed for a short-term stay that somebody may have the goal of returning home within 30 days, but they need that additional care through care management, medication management, continence products, living with purpose and activities programming. We have restaurant style dining in our communities and also being able to choose a suite that they might enjoy uh, at the community. And th this is also open for residents who may want to stay long-term at Sunrise and just really give them an opportunity to come in and experience the care and the service that's provided at Sunrise for them to then make uh, a, whether it's their loved ones or responsible parties, to make a longer term decision on staying with Sunrise for an extended period of time. So why does Sunrise have these types of partnerships? So Sunrise looks at our professional partners that, and we want partners that understand our mission to champion the quality of life for all seniors. Those are the partners we want, Chantel, David, and Brad that they understand what we're doing and how we're providing that high level of care. Also, you know, having um, partners like legal, uh, the Geller Group and, and Chantel, and having the right legal documents in place prior to a crisis. I know Brad pointed that out. And also planning long-term financially. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with families and work through their long-term care insurance policies that they haven't even read in, in 15, 20 years. And they're asking me to help them uh, identify what's an ADL or will this be paid for, won't it be paid for? They're already at the starting line and they're trying to figure out what are their legal documents say. So I would encourage anybody on the call or to share with your groups that, that, that those decisions should really be made prior to an event, a life-changing event. Um, the option to have additional care at home, we, we want to be able to do that if we can take a resident into our communities uh, immediately, that we have the option to provide a trusted partner to, to go to the home and be uh, of service. So I, I just wanna say all the professionals that shared information today have played roles in, in the care that we provide in assisted living and memory care at Sunrise. And we're, we appreciate that. So quick note, as we're coming in the stretch here, uh, this resident you see in this picture, 107 years old, she's in one of our, I believe, New Jersey communities. And we, she survived the Spanish flu, 1918. She survived COVID uh, this past year and celebrated her 107th birthday with us at sunrise. So that's, it's just a small um, snapshot of what's going on in our communities and how we're providing the highest quality care, even in these challenging times. And thankfully, I think we're on the other side across the board um, through our communities. But this is just a great story that's been shared throughout the nation on this specific resident. So I post uh, a few uh, contact pieces of information here. And I, I just wanna share, um, I appreciate everybody taking the time to join us on this call today. I know we're a little bit over, um, but I just wanted to thank everybody for, uh, and our expert panel for sharing their professional feedback. And I can tell you personally, with, with sharing a story briefly with my mom, she lives in assisted living made a decision as a family that was the best option for her several years ago. She's also diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and she's also battling cancer currently. So, you know, it's not a sob story. It's actually a, a success story because we planned as a family and, and encouraged um, my mother to get connected with the right professionals 
and to be able to make a decision to move into assisted living and update her legal documents, I can share. It's it's very easy to have that healthcare proxy or POA, um, the medical POA, all of that's done. And if that's a takeaway for anybody on this call today, uh, I highly recommend you you take action. Um, this this group has spent a lot of time together and we support each other and we're here to support you. So I can share personally how these um, these services can be very impacting on, on my, my life and I'm sure for your personal situations that you have going on. So with that, thank you very much. Let me just take a quick peek at the chat. Um, we got a lot of thank yous. Thanks for connecting all of us today. I appreciate the feedback on the legal, but let's take a look. Uh, is homecare.com in California? Yes or no question? N no, no, they're not. Okay. And I think that's about it. So thank you again, everyone. This does conclude our presentation today. Brad, David, and Chantel, I appreciate your time. And I'll leave this uh, share screen if you want to take a snapshot, anybody that's on. We, we appreciate your time. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nate. Thanks for putting this together, Nate. Good job. My pleasure.